What's going on guys? Hope this video finds you well. So this is the second of three Hashino Persona character tier lists I intended to do for the channel. The first of which being for the characters in the main cast. This one that I'm about to do being of the social link specific characters and one final one covering the antagonists. If I were to include these characters on this list, for instance, with the main cast and the antagonists, I feel like it'd be very easy for a lot of characters to get overshadowed. Since the main cast are obviously the most prevalent and the most fleshed out, it'd be very easy for them to dominate the upper tiers. Now, a few things to note before I get started. These tier lists are not to be compared, and that goes for all my lists on the channel. They're always relative to the batch of things that I am actually ranking. I have not played Persona 3 Portable, so I have chosen to omit the few FemC Route exclusive S-Link characters. That's not an indictment on their quality at all. I just don't have experience with those characters in the slightest, so I figured it would be best to omit them in this case. And one last thing is you'll notice I'm not including the characters in the main cast that do have social links confidants because I've already discussed them in the dedicated main cast character tier list, which also means that this tier list is not necessarily ranking the social links themselves as far as the events that take place. However, when it comes to the vast majority of the characters on this list, that is pretty much all we have to go off of as far as their character is concerned. Though with several characters on here that do have prevalence outside of their specific social link, I will be factoring in those aspects. Now, the criteria for the tiers will be pretty much the same as last time with S tier being my absolute favorite characters on this list, A tier being a very strong ranking, and you could even consider them being some of my favorites, just not quite the top of the top. B tier is going to be characters I do like, but maybe it doesn't go beyond that. Just because it's the tier that's in the middle doesn't necessarily equate to them being mid, which is also a term that I'm not super fond of using generally, at least in my videos. C tier is going to be characters where I'm kind of meh on them, and then D tier are going to be characters that I actually dislike like. It's hard for me to say at a glance if anyone is even going to end up in the D tier, but I'll just leave it there for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go Arcana by Arcana. Sometimes certain Arcana are represented by characters in the main cast, so I'll just skip those as needed. So first and foremost, we have on this list the Soul Magician Arcana, Kenji. Now, I've mentioned before that many of Persona 3's social links appear to be pretty mundane, at least on the surface, especially when compared to P5's confidants, where the events that take place throughout many of those are a lot more dynamic and bombastic in some cases, which is very fitting for P5's overall aesthetic. But when it comes to P3 and even P4 to an extent, I kind of have grown to appreciate the mundanity or seeming mundanity for a lot of of these links because it makes a lot of the characters feel a little bit more realistic just because much of life is very mundane especially when you're talking about a lot of characters that are in school or that is pretty much all they have going on aside from potential extracurriculars despite this perceived mundanity i think especially in p3's case the focus is less so on the events that you're doing and more so on the actual character that you're interacting with and usually tends to focus on a singular character flaw they may have that they work through alongside you throughout set social link. And so Kenji's character flaw is infatuation with someone who realistically he was never going to end up with. And that may seem very apparent to the protagonist and also the player, which understandably makes Kenji seem like a bit of a dumbass. But at the same time, I don't think it is uncommon for a student to have a crush on a teacher. And I also think that it does make sense from Kenji's perspective, being so desperate to be with an older woman that he was misconstruing private teaching lessons with the teacher actually flirting with him and all that. It's really one of those life lessons that I feel like has to be kind of lived through, as shown by the fact that no matter what you choose as the dialogue options for said social link, you're not able to break through to Kenji because he is so convinced that what is happening between him and Miss Kano is real, even though it very clearly isn't. Kenji does get some additional scenes outside of his S link, like with the school festival and the trip to Kyoto. And I would say that I like Kenji, so that puts him at the very least in the B tier. Now, the priestess and empress characters I've already talked about, so that gets us to the Soul Emperor character on this list being Hidetoshi. I like Hidetoshi's link quite a bit. It is a little awkward if you split it over the two semesters. You go on summer break and you come back and they're still talking about the whole cigarette butt in the bathroom thing. It's just kind of a small detriment to the way these games are structured and the way the social links are written as well. It would be interesting if some or most of the social links in a Persona 6, for instance, made it so you could rank everyone up to around five and then you have summer break away from those characters 
characters and then you come back and then there's another five ranks that maybe more directly have to do with whatever narrative kinds of things might be happening. I'm just always thinking about ways that social links could be made a little more dynamic. Not that I necessarily have a problem with the more linear structure of the social links and confidants that we have, but after three games of them being more or less the same structurally, I am hoping to see a little bit more of a shakeup or some experimentation. But Hidetoshi's particular character flaw is being a bit of a control freak or just has a very high view of himself as far as his authority over his peers, which leads to the situation with something that is seemingly minor. Maybe it is more major in Japanese society, but having a cigarette butt being left in the bathroom means someone was smoking in the bathroom. That would definitely be punishable in America, but I would assume that in Japan that's maybe even more of a major thing, probably. But even so, some of his peers on the student council eventually are like, hey, it's not that big a deal. As Hidetoshi goes around interrogating people, he gets punched in the face one time, which is very fitting for the way he was grilling people who were seemingly totally innocent. By the end of the link, I don't think it's ever discovered who actually left the cigarette butt in the bathroom, but that's kind of the point, is that it doesn't really matter. And that kind of helps Hidetoshi to realize that he shouldn't sweat the small stuff so much. Though he does get pulled into a teacher's office later on in the link about the cigarette butt, I think they actually did want to still find the culprit. And when Makoto Yuki, the protagonist of P3, gets brought up as a potential suspect because he kind of, I guess, has a delinquent look about him, Hidetoshi refuses to rat out Makoto because he knows it wasn't him, but also because he's grown to become friends with him. I really respect the hell out of that, and then by the end of the game, as with many S-Links and Persona 3 especially, Hidetoshi is very grateful to Makoto for sticking by him and helping him realize the error of his ways. I not only enjoy the process of going through the social link, but I also just really appreciate the character growth that we see from Hidetoshi to the point of putting him in the A tier. Next up, we have the Hierophant, which actually contains four characters. So first of all, we have Bunkichi and Mitsuko, the old couple at the bookstore. Now this S-Link in particular, I don't find to be all that interesting in the grand scheme of things. It does show a window into the grieving process and letting go of past traumas in that this old couple lost their son. He was a teacher at the school. They planted a persimmon tree in his honor. And so when the school states that they're going to tear down the persimmon tree, the old couple panic. A petition gets started by their son's old students to try to stop the tree from getting bulldozed. But when the old couple realize that the persimmon tree getting bulldozed would be to build another building for the school, they decide to allow it to happen so that way his memory can live on through the opportunities that will afford the students of GeckoCon. So not my favorite S-Link from a narrative angle necessarily, but I do really like just hanging out with these two. They're just a really sweet old couple. Bunkichi's a bit of a wisecracker, got a bit of an odd sense of humor, but they're just cute old people. I like these characters more than I like their S-Link specifically, or rather I like their S-Link for the excuse to interact with them as characters as opposed to the actual plot events that take place. And there's also something about that bookstore that they run that feels very familiar and cozy, despite how cramped and cluttered it might appear. I'm going to throw these guys in the B tier. Now moving on to Ryotaro Dojima. Dojima's S-Link is one of, if not maybe my favorite one in P4, and his presence in the main story is also great. So Dojima's wife was killed in a hit and run in the years prior to the events of P4, leaving him as sole caretaker of his young daughter Nanako in the backwoods town of Inaba. And so because Dojima is a detective on what I would assume to be a very small police force, he's unable to really be there for his daughter and has thrown himself into his work and has been trying to also track down his wife's killer to the point of not spending as much time as he should be with Nanako, given that Nanako is actually present in that moment. And so it very much is similar to much of the message of Persona 3, actually, not taking the things in front of you for granted and making the most of the life that you have, as opposed to being hung up on traumas of the past or worries of the future. This link gets pretty heavy, not just with the subject matter of his late wife, but the way that Narukami presses Dojima at times about why he's doing what he's doing, Dojima snapping back at him, or Nanako getting involved in him getting upset at either her or you, just kind of adds to the realism of the situation that Dojima is living through. And even though Narukami is his nephew, he does end up eventually being very much like a son to Dojima, which I really like that dynamic, especially because Narukami is able to kind of help raise Nanako in a way, and as I'll get into in a bit, helping Nanako deal with these same traumas, but as a young girl as opposed to a grown man. And I just 
just really love the perspective that is put on this situation between these two characters and how involved they are in each other's social links as well. And then you add to that Dojima's presence in the main story, of course, P4 is a murder mystery. And so Dojima being a detective on the police force in Inaba, he is very involved in that investigation, which also just adds to how busy he is with work. I feel like his presence in the main story kind of speaks for itself. So yeah, Dojima is going to go in the S tier. And I'll double back to Nanako when we get to the Justice Arcana. So now we have Sojuro, who plays a very similar role to Dojima. It's something I've mentioned in previous videos where I find it kind of weird that the living situation in P5 is so similar to P4. And I'm really hoping that this doesn't stay a trend when it comes to P6. I want something different as far as the main character's living situation is concerned. With that said, though, I do think Sojuro is one of my favorite characters in this batch, partially thanks to his presence outside of his confidant explicitly. Sojuro also shows up in Futaba's confidant at times, similar to the Nanako Dojima dynamic. And although Futaba and Sojuro are dealing with, again, an uncannily similar situation to the Dojimas, the way in which the two of them handle that trauma is different from the Dojimas. And so Sojuro, instead of escaping from his trauma through his work, he does it through going out and fraternizing after hours. As opposed to him ignoring Futaba, it's more that Futaba is ignoring him by shutting herself away. But I do like that throughout the course of both confidants, you see them grow to bond more alongside Ren. You kind of have a similar but different sort of family dynamic being built there, which I quite enjoy. And then of course, in the main story, Sojuro is very skeptical of Ren because of his criminal record, as unjustified as it may be, and just really keeping an eye on him, trying to make sure that he's keeping his nose clean, but growing to trust him over time and eventually learning the big secret about the Phantom Thieves and all that jazz, and kind of flipping his perspective to withholding that information and defending Ren when needed. So yeah, it's pretty hard for Sojuro to not be an S tier given how prevalent he is, though I probably would lean more in Dojima's favor as far as the order in which I'd rank these two. The Lover's Arcana is all party members. We have one Chariot Arcana character here being Kazushi. I wouldn't say that I dislike Kaz's Link or him as a character, but I am also not super crazy about him either. It is very much another Link that is very mundane on the surface. Kaz injures his leg, but is being stubborn about taking a break from track and field because he made a promise to his nephew who forget if his nephew has some kind of condition or what the deal is but Kaz as an able-bodied individual kind of agreed to do his best and try to win the track meet to make his nephew feel better or something to that effect. I'd say Kaz's character flaw is that of not taking care of yourself and in a way being overly selfless. From Kaz's perspective he probably thinks he must win this meet no matter the cost but all he's doing by trying to run on an injured knee is doing damage to himself that may end up being permanent as opposed to letting it rest to the point where he is able to do things for others like his nephew. And also the fact that his nephew would likely understand the situation that he physically cannot do track and field. Even if he didn't permanently damage his leg, it's not like he was going to win on an injured knee. And the damage that he might do would prevent him from ever participating in track and field again. I think there is probably an element here of not taking your able-bodiedness for granted, which is kind of in the same vein as taking care of yourself, especially on the physical side, to make sure that you don't permanently damage yourself to the point where you do seriously hurt yourself and are no longer able to execute certain daily operations. Now, while I think that the message behind this Link and Kaz's character is a good one, I do think that Kaz is a bit too stubborn, even if it is understandable. I just don't really fully buy into his character. I wouldn't say I dislike him, but he might be more so in the eh category. Now moving on to the Justice Arcana, we have Shihiro, treasurer of the student council at Gekukan High School, and very much the shy, bookish type, which leads her to being a fan favorite in many people's eyes. This is one of the few S-Links that I've not seen all the way through in-game. I did go ahead and watch the remaining ranks that I had not seen, and I would say that the later ranks of Shihiro's Link make me appreciate her as a character a bit more, sort of in a similar vein to Hitotoshi, where the character growth she goes through is very admirable. To even start Shihiro's Link, you have to talk to her several times for her to build up the confidence to want to hold a conversation with you because you are a guy, and she kind of has a fear of men, which I think is later revealed in her link or in supplemental material or something as being because her father is abusive in some way. I don't know if it's verbal or what the deal is, but it's not like a great representation of men, and so she understandably is very skittish around guys. Beyond that, the main plot of her social link has to do with some money goes missing, and because she's the treasurer, she gets blamed for it. She eventually builds up the courage to approach the male teacher who she had handed the envelope on 
off to. And it turns out this teacher mistakenly brought it home with him. And even though he had intentions of bringing it back, the deadline was pushed back or something. And so he didn't really rush to resolve this issue, but it was causing Jahiro a lot of grief because of the rumors that were spreading about her taking the money. And the confidence she shows in that scene where she confronts that teacher is a complete 180 from where she starts, which is really cool. I really like this arc that she has, and this is definitely going to be a link that I prioritize on my future Persona 3 runs, though I would hope that I'd be able to do all the links in following P3 runs. And I think that is enough for me to give Chihiro the A tier. Another Justice Arcana character, we have Nanako, who I already kind of discussed with her father, where she's kind of handling her mom's passing from a different perspective. She's very young and was even younger when her mom passed away, so she understandably doesn't understand that her mom isn't coming back, and that does come up, I think, several times. Maybe not even just in the social link, but in the main story, that is kind of a sticking point as well. And so having to try to convey these things to a young child in a way that doesn't upset them, and in a way that they're able to accept these inevitabilities of life at a very young age is a delicate process, but I think it does show a lot of maturity on Nanako's part. While she will likely be dealing with that trauma and that sense of loss for years to come, I do think that between Dojima's link and Nanako's link, you kind of help bring these two together in a way that had previously not been there by helping them kind of through their traumas in a sense, and to realize that what is in front of them is what matters most and not taking that for granted. Yeah, Nanako's got to be another S tier, very prominent in the main story as well, so hard to argue with that. Next up, we got a couple of Hermit links. First off, we have Maya. I do want to say that I very much appreciate that they gave Maya specifically a portrait in Reload. I thought that was a nice touch. And while I guess you could argue, oh, it, it spoils the twist, it's like, well, the twist becomes pretty obvious just a few ranks into the link, as far as I remember. So I don't really feel like a ton is lost. I really like this link, not only because it takes me back to a time where internet culture was very much as it is portrayed in this link, but also because it shows this other side to a character you see fairly often at school being Miss Toriyumi in a completely different light and kind of makes a lot of her dialogue in the school setting make more sense and kind of help flesh her out as a character. And you add to that her whole freak out at the very end of the game if you maxed her social link where she discovers that you were the person she was talking to in the MMO. There's a lot of limitation when it comes to not being able to explicitly date Toriyumi, but to that I say, who cares? I don't know if it's a wish fulfillment thing on the part of certain players or on behalf half of the main character or what the deal is, but I really don't feel like much, if anything, would have been added if you were able to date Toriyumi. Especially because, as I was saying, these links are very linear and you could conceivably do them at any time, so allowing that opportunity just doesn't really make much sense from a design and structure standpoint, but also from a narrative standpoint, I think it's nice when there is a bit of restraint when it comes to these kinds of things. There is another teacher link on this list that leans a little bit too far into the wish fulfillment side of things to where I actually find the option to date that character to be maybe somewhat of a detractor, actually. And it's fine to want things that are unrealistic, I guess. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. The dating sides of these games are so half-baked that I just have a hard time understanding why so many people get hung up on that aspect, both from a fan perspective and from a hater perspective as well. It's not an aspect to these games that draws me in in a major way. I just don't feel like much is lost by not being able to date Maya or Tori. Yumi. That said, though, this is easily one of the most memorable links in P3, and that freak out at the end really adds a lot. This is a character where it's hard for me not to put her in S tier. The other hermit link we have is the fox, and there's really not much to say. I don't think I maxed this one just because the errands are so ambiguous and tedious, and you add to that the fact that the fox can't talk, so I just have a hard time evaluating this character as anything more than kind of whatever. This is not a Koromaru situation where Koromaru is best boy and he gets that honorary higher tier rank. Ranking. I feel like the fox has got to go in C. Like, it's really just kind of a whatever link that I could honestly take or leave. It's possible that some of the situations that you go do for the fox might have some added value there, but that doesn't really speak to the fox as a character itself. Moving on to the Fortune Arcana, we've got Keisuke, another P3 link that I've not finished all the way through. Keisuke is caught between wanting to follow his passion of being an artist and his parents' desire for him to become a doctor like them. It's a matter of him choosing between these two things that he's both good at and also does seem to enjoy. The art side of things is obvious that he enjoys doing that. Otherwise, why would he pursue it, right? But when it comes to the medicine side of things, he kind of reluctantly is knowledgeable about that stuff, but it is clear that he does take some joy in helping people in that 
that regard. I think what he decides to do, as far as I remember, is that he does decide to go and become a doctor. And so I guess his S-Link is about Makoto and the other people around him helping him realize that he would both be very good at being a doctor and also would take enjoyment from that career path. I do find Keisuke to be a little bit milk toast as a character. I'm very torn if I want to give him C or B. He's on the cusp for me. And we have Chihaya, who I don't think I finished her link. I think I got very far in it, though. Typically, there is a reason why you prioritize certain links or confidants over others. Primarily, I would assume being that you are drawn to certain characters more than others. Sometimes it has to do with availability and even getting some of these links started as to why you would do them later in the game. And when it comes to Jahaya's, there's not really much else to do at night much of the time as far as progressing confidants in this case. I'm kind of using those terms interchangeably. I don't know if I referred to a confidant as a social link. I really don't care. But yeah, Jahaya is kind of roped into this scam where I think she moved to this city from a small town and was maybe not taken in, but kind of accepted by somewhat shady characters who kind of roped her into the fortune telling thing, or at the very least, were trying to have her sell things that were just placebos. I think her link has something to do with her learning to stand up to these people and taking her life back. But I would say that I don't really feel that strongly about Jahaya. She's fine as a character, but honestly, in, in my opinion, one of the least standout characters in this roster, at the very least on the P5 side of things. So I kind of want to give her a C, which again, isn't really a dislike ranking. It's just more kind of, eh, I would be lying to you if I said that I felt any stronger about Jahaya. Moving on to the strength, Arcana, we have Yuko, another fan favorite from Persona 3, which I can see a lot more clearly from Reload than when I played Fess. I remember there was some line that Yuko had in Fess. She was asking about, oh, should I go on a diet? Something to that effect. And I remember playing Fess and thinking to myself, I really don't give a shit about this, like at all. I don't recall this coming up in Reload, so I wonder if it was a weekend hangout thing, as opposed to being actually part of the S-Link. That kind of thing put me off from her link, to the point where I didn't even unlock Mutatsu when I played Fess originally. And I would say that the early ranks of her link don't really leave me impressed either. I mean, this time around I knew that Mutatsu would unlock after a few ranks, and so I pushed through to at least do that, and then of course I was pushing to try to do all of the S-Links in full. I did end up maxing her link this time, and I like Yuko as a character. She kind of has somewhat of a motherly vibe going on because she's dealing with young kids and ends up deciding to become a teacher, I think, in order to kind of guide the youth, and I, I think that is an admirable character trait to have. I'm trying to remember what her specific character flaw was, though. Maybe it was indecisiveness, maybe a little bit of insecurity there, too, but I'd say that's more Fuka's thing if we were to kind of assign each of these character flaws to only a singular character, whereas Realistically speaking, there's probably multiple you could apply to multiple of these characters. I don't really find Yuko's S-Link to be super, super memorable, but she is an enjoyable character to be around, to the point where I would probably lump her in with the B-tier characters. Then we have Ko and Daisuke. Now, thankfully, I have played Persona 4 Golden twice, first time of which I did Ko's Link, and this most recent time I did Daisuke's, and I like these two quite a bit. As I was speaking on before, with Social Links being a little bit more experimental, P4 might be the most experimental when it comes to S-Links, because of course P3 established them, and then P5 had some unique things going on, like the different abilities you got at certain ranks in addition to the fusion bonus, and locking certain ranks of links behind social stats as opposed to locking entire links behind social stats. Stats. So it's not really that different, but P4 with these two, as well as another S-Link I'll get to later on, were a little bit more experimental in that, yes, you pick between basketball and soccer and therefore focus primarily on Ko or Daisuke respectively, but they are both present in both sides of the link. I think that does add a lot to both of them because you both get the perspective of focusing on one of their struggles and then the other one being more of the supportive friend, depending on which side you pick for your playthrough. It's hard for me to kind of judge these guys individually because they are so intertwined. Ko, I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since that playthrough, but I know his has to do with some kind of family drama. I forget if it's that he discovers he was adopted or something along those lines, and maybe realizing that it doesn't matter because that is his family anyway. That sounds about right. And Dice case has to do with girl troubles, I guess, where back in middle school, he was quote-unquote dating someone, and that kind of comes back up, and honestly, I'm not really too hung up on the details of the S-Links themselves. Themselves. This is very much one of those links, kind of similar to the old couple, but to a greater degree where I just kind of enjoy hanging out with these guys in the game as opposed to being too concerned about the specific events of their links, even though, especially on Ko's side of things, I think there is a lot of emotion. But with all that said, they're going to go in the A tier. 
And we have the Hanged Man Arcana, starting with Maiko, who, similar to what I said about Nanako, is dealing with her parents getting divorced, and the MC is having to try to convey the realities of that to this child, who maybe doesn't quite understand the entirety of the situation. I think it's just a really heartfelt and wholesome link that I enjoy. I'd probably put Maiko in the B tier. Now we have Naoki. This link is, as far as I understand, very overlooked. Even by myself in my first P4G run, I didn't even really figure out how to start it because it's kind of something that could easily be lost in the weeds because you have to go to help out at the nurse's office or something. That's not really something that I feel like is presented to you super clearly as an option. And I think you might have to do it a couple times to even start the S link. But what I found when I did go out of my way to start this S link in my most recent P4G run was that Naoki is one of my favorite social links in P4 and maybe just kind of period on this list, which was very surprising to me because I've always found Saki being Naoki's sister, who is a very early victim of the murders in the events of P4, to be a pretty underwhelming character. I guess that might be kind of the point in that you didn't really know her that well, and it's really more the perspective of Yosuke who did know her and Naoki being her brother, where you kind of get insight into Saki and and really the tragedy of her death. Whereas having not done Naoki's Link on my first play, I didn't really feel that bad about Saki's death just because it was someone that I didn't know that well. And I know that's a terrible thing to say. I mean, this is fiction. It is a different scenario. And this is something that is definitely touched on in P3 when it comes to Shinji. Although in that game, you do get to know Shinji much better than Saki. But with all that said, I do think that doing Naoki's Link made me appreciate and feel for that tragedy, not just of her death, but also of the family's failing business. And Naoki kind of having to bear a lot of that responsibility unjustly because he is just a kid and his older sister was killed. You add to that Juness encroaching on their family liquor store, which is just a lot to deal with in that household, I'm sure. And because Inaba is such a small town, Naoki is having to deal with a lot of people, especially older folks, not just talking about him behind his back and all of that, but also showering him with pity that he doesn't really want or need in his scenario. He's dealing with enough without having strangers, even if maybe they are acquaintances and people he knows, but you know, people who are not directly directly really involved, poking their nose in his family's business. It's just a very emotional link, and I think it is one where Naoki definitely could seem off-putting at first, but I think it's very understandable why he does give Narukami the cold shoulder early on. But the further you get, and especially when you get to the point where he breaks down crying at the end, or at the very least towards the end, really solidify this link as being one of my favorites. For just talking the S link alone, Naoki would maybe be at the number one spot currently, but because I'm not doing that as I've mentioned, I'm gonna put him just below the dojimas. This is what I mean by it being kind of tricky to rank things, especially when I'm not just looking at the specific 10 rank events of the given social links or confidants. And the last hanged man we have is EY, who is just a very fascinating confidant and shows a perspective that is otherwise not really represented in any of these three games. And that's partially because P5, I think, tried to make a lot of its confidants stand out by revolving around aspects of society that you might not have seen in the previous two games, which on the one hand is admirable, but on the other hand, I feel like it can at times lose that personal character focus and be a little bit too focused on the crazy shit you might end up getting into. He is ex-Yakuza and you're dealing with his ties to that in various ways and him trying to not get roped back into things. Provides not only an interesting confidant from a plot perspective, but also gives a lot of insight into EY as a character as he becomes more okay with opening up to Ren. And you add to that something that I very much enjoy in games with dialogue options, where usually the cheeky response or kind of the quote unquote stupid response, which I sometimes selected to just see the reactions of said characters, UI actually takes to those kind of more wild dialogue options, which I think is fun and kind of shows that he's not all bad of a guy despite appearances and his past. Of course, you do have the scenario with his son, which I don't think is the most interesting character, especially because his son doesn't have a portrait, which I find kind of odd. It's kind of whatever, but honestly, it's hard to remember a lot of the minute details, but UI is one of the stronger P5 confidants for sure, which would probably lead me to giving him the S tier. Next, we have the Death Arcana. I guess I'll note that Pharos isn't on here because he's basically the same character as Ryoji, and I put Ryoji on the antagonists list. So I guess you could argue in some way for him being on any three of these lists. I opted to put him there instead, and I'm not overlapping any characters between the lists either. I think Hisano's link is sympathetic in a way, but I also just didn't really find it to be that interesting, and not really in the same way that I've said about some of the P3 links either. It's not like I hate her link, 
link necessarily, but I would say that I didn't enjoy it as much as even the C tier characters. And that's not to say that I really hate this character or something. Relative to everyone else we've talked about thus far, this is probably the weakest link slash character with the exception of, I guess, the fox, which gets some cute points, I suppose. I guess a side note is that I do find it weird how viscerally some people dislike certain characters in these games. When at the end of the day, even if in one of my videos I really lay into a character as far as not liking them, in the grand scheme of like life in general, these things don't really bother me that much compared to what it seems to be for certain people on the internet, which is just something that I find odd to each their own, I suppose. With all that said, I just don't really care for Hisano that much. I mean, her link is about her late husband and her feeling like she is responsible somehow. I think she mentions that she had thoughts of pulling the plug on him when he was going through some kind of Alzheimer's thing or something or other. I find that sympathetic, but after doing her link, I just really wasn't that impressed. It's definitely one that is probably going to take lower priority should I play Persona 4 in the future. Just going to give her the D tier, especially because there's not really a ton of contenders for D tier on this list, I feel like. So I'm just going to put someone down there at least. And then we have Takemi. There's depth here. There's good characterization and an arc and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to online discussion, it just tends to get overshadowed by Horny. And I find that to be kind of a shame. I wouldn't say that I'm as wild about Takemi as a character as a lot of people seem to be. But I do think that her confidant is one of the better ones in P5 for sure. It's a very interesting situation to be in, like kind of a back alley doctor who used to have high esteem in the community, but was ostracized because of some false information given by her superior and then eventually getting back at said superior but Takemi ultimately deciding to stay as a local back alley doctor with more of a smile on her face at the very least as opposed to her more off-putting nature at the start. I find it a shame that the whole goth mommy shit is like the first thing that comes to many people's minds when talking about this character. I'm just way more interested in learning about these characters as characters as opposed to who the protagonist can bang. You feel me? So yeah I feel like Takemi for me is more like an A tier. Still a very strong confidant and no doubt one of the best in P5, but I'm really trying to make the S tier mean something as far as my perspective on these characters. Next up, we have the Temperance Arcana. First up, Bebe, whom I think the voice acting does a lot for. I play Persona games and Mega Ten games in general with Japanese voices when that's an option. That's kind of what I prefer. Many of these games are very Japan-centric, and so I find it a little jarring to play, especially the Persona games in English. But even when it comes to listening to Japanese voice acting, you definitely can hear a semblance of tone and emotion from voice acting in languages that you don't don't speak natively. I always find that to be a weird point of contention. I mean, play how you want. I really don't give a shit. If you prefer the dub, like that's great. Rock on, man. But for me, as someone who did play with the Japanese voice cast, despite not speaking Japanese, I did find Bebe's S-Link compared to Fess to be much more emotional, especially and specifically the rank when he finds out his aunt died was heartbreaking. And I feel bad that I wasn't able to push through the rest of his Link because this is the third and final P3 Link that I wasn't able to finish all the way through this time alongside Keisuke and Jihiro. So I don't know what ultimately ends up happening with Bebe. I feel like I've heard that he goes back to France, despite not wanting to, and just kind of enjoying his short-lived time in Japan for what it was, but I don't know for sure. I'll say that that scene of him breaking down about halfway through is enough for him to at least get in the B tier. Assuming his S-Link doesn't just fall off a cliff, I'd probably put him just above Yuko, which is surprising because I feel like this Link seemed very easy to write off for whatever reason, especially back in Fest. I do feel like Reload did do this character a little more justice, alongside many of P3's S-Link exclusive characters who may not have had a ton of voice lines, if any. And that is something that in the event of a P4 remake could change my mind on some of those characters, potentially, who knows. Eri is the stepmother of the child that you watch after when you do the daycare job. This is one of those where it just wasn't a priority and so I didn't end up getting very far in it. This S-Link is usually regarded as one of the weakest, if not maybe the weakest in P4. I don't want to judge it too harshly considering I haven't done the Link all the way through, but from what I've seen outside of what I've actually done in game, I just find this character to be kind of land and not very interesting. I'm sure there's a tinge of realism there and maybe there is a certain group of people who would appreciate this Link more. I don't know for sure. All I know is that this Link just seems kind of boring to me. There's no R&D, just a character that I can't say that I feel like anything towards, which is maybe worse than actively disliking a character and having something more interesting to dig into on the negative side of things. Can't wait to see all the comments about how I'm so wrong about this character and that she's actually underrated and all that. Yeah, really looking forward to that. Sarcasm aside, I would be interested if there is some redeeming quality to this character that I'm missing. Next up, we have Kawakami. If you put all of the horny aside, I think Kawakami 
Murakami is genuinely probably one of the best confidants in P5. And the more I've reflected on this character, the more I think she is absolutely S-tier worthy, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the maid outfit, or the dating, or the that's the best part. And so I find the focus on that, while it is highly memeable, I feel like it does detract something, at least from the conversation surrounding the character. I wouldn't say it really detracts much from my perception of the character within the game itself. Kamakami's situation is somewhat tragic when you think about it, where she was tutoring this kid. I forget what the circumstance was exactly that led to him dying, but because Kawakami was his tutor, his parents ended up pinning his death on her, in addition to blackmailing her for money so as to not escalate things to court or something to that effect. It's a really fucked up situation. I do find it kind of a shame that the main solution to a lot of P5 confidant problems is going into the metaverse and changing someone's heart in mementos. Not because of that weird fucking talking point that some people have brought up about, oh, it's not realistic. It teaches you that you can just solve your problems by being a superhero. It's like, no, that's like a terrible argument. It makes no sense. I don't like it because I think it kind of undermines the potential for solving these problems in more of a personal way, as opposed to leveraging your superpowers in this case to forcibly change things. It's fine. I mean, it fits with the game's power system and lore and all of that, I suppose. And maybe it'd be a little bit weird if you didn't change anyone's hearts aside from the main antagonists or palace rulers. But the fact that quite possibly every confidant in P5, if not the vast majority of them have you doing this, I think does kind of undercut the impact of doing that. And also maybe introduces a number of potential plot holes as far as like, well, why don't you just change his heart? Like, yeah, these games do require some suspension of disbelief, but it is an aspect to the way P5 handles confidants that I am not the biggest fan of. In addition to pretty much all of them figuring out that you're in the Phantom Thieves, which yeah, is fairly obvious on one hand, but at the same time, I do feel like it does at least subtly detract compared to the vast majority of P3 and P4's social links where they're kind of none the wiser to what you have been doing in Tartarus or the TV world, respectively. Tangent aside, I do think Kawakami is an S tier character by characterization and growth alone, learning to stand up for herself, but also gaining some self-respect. She's kind of forced to work this humiliating night shift as a maid, quote unquote, in order to pay these bills that are being blackmailed on her by her former students' parents. And so it's just like a really unfortunate situation and definitely uncomfortable considering you're her student, but at the same time, that does, I think, elicit a sense of comfort in her, especially if you don't choose the dialogue options that force her to do the cutesy voice and like all that shit. You're paying her, she's making that money, but not having to deal with potentially shadier characters or whatever it might be. She can kind of be more herself in those instances and grows to be a very trustworthy figure that is a big help to the Phantom Thieves in several ways. Next up, we have the Devil Arcana, starting with President Tanaka. Tanaka is one of the more enjoyable S-Links in P3. You're dealing with this guy who is very clearly pretty shady. He literally tries to scam you, and that's how you start his S-Link, is paying him tens of thousands of yen. The weird thing is that he doesn't just cut and run. It is funny the way he calls out Makoto for just handing him money, where clearly he's not going to get a return on his investment. It's just a very entertaining link. He's mostly talking at Makoto during the S-Link. It doesn't really feel like you're having much of a dialogue, aside from Makoto's occasional interjections here and there. But that leads to Tanaka having somewhat of an existential crisis and sort of realizing that he's a scumbag and deciding to give back to charity and all that, which I think is quite fun. And then we have Sayoko, the nurse at the hospital that you work at. I like this link, although I do feel like it sort of falls off a cliff towards the end. Early on, she's very flirtatious. That is an element that I do actually feel like adds to this link because she's kind of, as far as I'm remembering, doing this kind of flirtatious thing as more of a defense mechanism than that necessarily being her personality. Sayoko's situation has to do with her previously dating one of the doctors at a hospital she used to work at and later hearing about a young patient of hers that ends up passing away, which understandably is kind of similar to Takemi as far as that component is concerned. After she does hear that bad news, she ends up becoming somewhat of a tyrant around the hospital and like being overly strict and kind of mean, whereas she used to be a little bit more lighthearted and playful towards the protagonist and just the people around her in general. This once again is a defense mechanism of her trying to prevent any future patients from passing, even if a lot of these things are outside of her control as much as she may try. That's just kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to that profession. I did find that as her link went on, I was kind of less and less impressed with the link itself. I do overall, I think, like Sayoko as a character, but it's probably more of a B tier for me. Then we have Oya, who gets a lot of shit, and I don't really fully understand why. It's not like I absolutely love Oya as a character or anything, but it's like I mentioned before, just this visceral hatred towards certain fictional characters is very odd to me, especially when they're seemingly as inoffensive as some that get a lot of shit. Now with Oya, I feel like she's just kind of forgettable. Her friend went missing in some previous investigation 
or something to that effect. And she finds out that she's alive and her old partner or boss or something in the journalism sphere is like trying to get her to stop looking into things. I really don't remember the details and I'm not super interested to look into them to refresh my memory, which kind of goes to show that I'm not super hot on this character in general. I do think that the circumstance it puts you in as far as having to go to this bar late at night as a high schooler is kind of an interesting setting at the very least. I do somewhat like Oya's personality where as you hang out with her more, you kind of realize that she is a little more conniving than she leads on, especially when she is trying to get information out of you and you just refuse to budge. I find that to be kind of an entertaining dynamic, I suppose. Overall, though, I probably put her in C or something. When I first finished playing P5R, I did feel more positively on this character, but as I've reflected on it over time, I'm kind of like, meh. And we have the tower, starting with Mutatsu, who, as I mentioned prior, was a link that I did not do in Fest, but did very much do in Reload. This one is one of the standouts in P3 for sure. First of all, you have this old monk hanging out in a club, which is just kind of an interesting juxtaposition where you wouldn't really pin a monk as being the type to go clubbing or really just kind of drinking in that kind of setting in general, because it's not like he's up on the dance floor or anything like that. But it is somewhat hard for me to think about each individual rank, especially because this is a link that I did pretty early on in my playthrough. Despite that, it's a character that I always looked forward to doing more of his link. Of course, he's dealing with his wife and son who have kind of ostracized him. I would assume because of his alcoholism, but I don't remember distinctly. Not only does he provide a lot of perspective and life advice to the protagonist, and that ties very much in with Persona 3's themes, but also has a bit of character growth on his own with setting aside his pride to go apologize to his family and join back up with them. I am kind of torn if I would give Mutatsu the S, which probably indicates that I don't feel strongly about him to that extent. The more I think about his link, I do enjoy his presence, and I do think that the setting has a lot to do with that, but it's really hard for me to remember individual ranks of his link. I'm still gonna give him the A tier for sure. If I put him in S, I feel like I'd be kind of stretching my feelings on this character a little bit further than I actually feel. We've got Shu. This link at first, I remember being like, why am I dealing with this snot-nosed kid? He's kind of a brat, whatever, whatever. The more I did of it, I actually grew to really like his link. I thought it was very wholesome how you invite the investigation team over to throw him a birthday party. I'd be hard-pressed to call Shu one of my favorite characters, but I do think that the way the link builds, because he feels pressured to be the best in his class, he does end up cheating and getting caught on a test or whatever. There's that whole angle, and he kind of has to learn the lesson of doing things to the best of your ability, even if you do fail, as opposed to trying to cheat your way to the top. I feel like this is definitely a B tier for me. And then we have Shinya Oda. This is a link that I didn't finish, but I did go back and watch it. This one's okay. I really just wasn't that into it. I mean, like, yeah, his mom's an asshole. You know, you do the thing that I was complaining about earlier about going into mementos to change your heart. It's not really a confidant or a character that I feel super strongly about, so I feel like he's just gonna end up in around the C tier. Mamoru tends to get lumped in with Kaz as far as being very similar characters. I actually very much disagree because I think Mamoru is the far more interesting character compared to Kaz. Mamoru is the one who beats the MC at the track and field meet and was regarded the biggest threat as far as that meet was concerned. But he ends up befriending you because he respects how you were almost able to keep up or whatever. And so he's got kind of that competitive side of him, which is kind of the focus early on. But there are several instances where he's either a no-show or he shows up late to the point where he does end up opening up about how his dad's no longer around. And so he's kind of the man of the house dealing with his mom and his many siblings, from what I understand, in a small apartment, not doing great financially. And so he ultimately ends up giving up track and field to go work in a factory elsewhere in order to send money back to his family to help them. It was just like a very mature thing for a high school kid to decide to do. I really respect that and ended up finding his link to not only be one of the most sympathetic in P3, but also just one of the most enjoyable, probably, to the point of wanting to put him in the A tier. Then we have Hifumi, the shogi player who you initially approach because you want to get some strategies for your Phantom Thief business and ultimately end up kind of getting roped into her situation where she's got a lot of parental pressure to be the best shogi player because her mom wants her to be a star in that space, I guess. It is found out later on that her mom was paying her opponents to throw games, which made her feel very insecure and second guess her skill to begin with, which is understandable. It's like a really shitty situation for her to be in. I do find her kind of dorkiness when it comes to the different things 
saying she'll exclaim when playing Chogi to be pretty cute and endearing. I used to feel a little bit less positively about Hifumi in the past, but I do think the confidant is strong enough to put her in A. Probably on the lower end of A though, but A tier nonetheless. Here we come to the infamous Moon Arcana. I'm gonna be honest, I fell for the Nozomi propaganda hook, line, and sinker at the very least when we were talking about Fess. But upon playing Reload, I think this is one of those links where the voice acting, the multiple different portraits, as well as the expressiveness of the 3D models does a lot for this character. That was previously not presented super well. Is Nozomi a shithead throughout most of his link? Yes, he's not what I would consider to be a good person really at all. But I do find him entertaining. Whereas what I might have done of his link in Fess, I didn't find him to be that way. So I think the presentation of his character in the ways I mentioned did a lot for my impression of Nozomi. Nozomi used to have a brother who was kind of the perfect one, whereas Nozomi was sort of the screw up or just at the very least not as good at pretty much anything in life compared to his brother. And so he felt very insecure about that. His brother ended up dying tragically. I think Nozomi kind of spiraled because of that, ended up joining a cult, ended up really giving into his gluttony. Throughout the course of the link, of course you're dealing with the cult shenanigans he's been putting people through, scamming people in that regard, which is not okay. But you do help him not worry about comparing himself to other people so much and just kind of doing the best he can. And I actually really felt for this character when he talks about, I'm going to try to be the best gore man in Japan or whatever. So that way when I pass, I can face my brother and say that I did something well. Now, I don't know that I would rank him super, super highly, but compared to a lot of people who would just automatically dump him in the bottom tier, I would definitely put him closer to the B tier somewhere. Like as a character and as a presence, I wouldn't say that I enjoy being around Nozomi necessarily, but I do think that there is more depth to the Link and his character than is apparent on the surface, maybe even more so than a lot of P3's S Links. Although I would say that stuff is probably too buried considering the general perception of this character, at least prior to Reload. Now we have Ai Ebihara. I didn't do much of her link, but upon looking into things, at the very least, this character has something going for her, being that her S link is pretty experimental, and I think is one of very few in P4 that you can actually end up reversing, which is a mechanic that was very prevalent in P3. And so from what I understand, you more or less have two options. You can either agree to date her early on, at which point she gradually realizes that she is not actually in love with you or whatever, and you end up breaking up and she doesn't grow as much as a person, or or you can deny her initial advances and she ends up learning a lot through being just friends with you. At which point, if you want, you can romance her, but that's besides the point. The thing with I though, is that she is very abrasive and bratty early on. I think that does put a lot of players off, myself included. I would be hard pressed to put her pretty low if only because of that character growth that she does see. And I think there is something to be said for the dynamism of her S-Link compared to many others. Though I wouldn't necessarily factor that into her as a character. It just shows two different circumstances that you could potentially go through with her. I'm going to put her in the B tier. There's obviously the potential for her moving up when I experience her S-Link fully for myself someday. Now, Mishima is a tricky one for me. The way he's portrayed is pretty realistic for that kind of character. He gets kind of carried away with his power, quote unquote, as essentially a moderator or the moderator of a very popular website in the Persona 5 universe. And so, yeah, very terminally online and socially awkward and all that kind of stuff. There are ranks of his confidant that are somewhat painful to witness, but because he feels feels a tie to the Phantom Thieves because he's running this fan site. That power goes to his head. You end up going into mementos, but instead of actually explicitly changing his heart, you just kind of plant the idea in his head that he's taking things too far and he kind of comes to that conclusion on his own. I think there's a point where he says he thought that you had changed his heart, but then you tell him, no, it was all you. Now that I do like as a twist on how most of these confidants end up. I've talked about characters in the past that while they might be a little uncomfortable or cringy in their dialogue or the way they act, it is pretty realistic to that type of character. And I've been pretty vocal about not discrediting a character because of that. The thing that bothers me about Mishima, which is another thing I've tried to separate in my mind previously, is just the sheer amount of times this guy fucking texts you throughout the game. It's so annoying at a certain point. While I was playing P5R, I went out of my way to rescue many, if not maybe all, of the people who got lost in mementos or had to have changes of heart in mementos. But there was a certain point where Mishima just kept texting and texting and texting about this shit to where I was just not even reading half of the shit that he 
was saying in the late game. This is something that I feel about P5 just kind of generally is that the texting is too much. Maybe this has to do with me in real life not being a big texter. I find the way that P3 Reload handled the text messages to be way more tasteful and not as intrusive. In fact, the fact that you only see new messages and they don't like keep a log of every single text you gain throughout the game was a huge positive for me. Though I will say the newsletters for the part-time jobs were pretty annoying because you always had to read them in order to get that notification out of the corner of your screen, which is like a little annoying, not really that big a deal compared to P5 with the myriad of texting that happens in that game, which mind you is realistic for the time period compared to the time P3 is set. I definitely do have some nostalgia for the flip phone era. Maybe that has to do with why I'm not that big of a texter to begin with, but there are a lot of people my age who also grew up with flip phones that are perpetually texting, which I just have never really been that interested in. It's not a mode of communication that I would say that I like that much. And so that is something that turned me off from Mishima as a character. Maybe it is a little unfair because that is more so a gameplay mechanic than it necessarily is characterization, but I'd say that it leans more so into characterization than something like Morgana telling you to go to sleep. Though I guess you could say that's in character for Morgana. They did cut it back in Royal, whereas I doubt there was any cutback as far as Mishima's texts from Vanilla to Royal. And because I did his confidant pretty early on in the game, pretty much all of my correspondence with Mishima were these texts that were pissing me off with their volume and verboseness. I guess I can give him B tier, because I do feel like his character growth is solid. All right, just a few more to go. We got the Sun Arcana. Akinari is going to be probably the final S tier for this list. His link thematically and just topically lines up probably more so than any other Persona 3 S link as far as the overall message being making the most of the time that you have on this planet and not taking life for granted, no matter how much it might kick you while you're down. Akinari being a relatively young man who is slowly dying from some disease kind of embodies that. And yeah, this link is just very heavy when it comes to the subject matter. There's just some really good lessons in there and things to think about as well when it comes to Akinari's perspective and the way in which Makoto can kind of push back. And Akinari eventually accepting he is going to pass and like leaving behind his children's book as a legacy. I do find the last rank of his link a little bit weird. I'm not entirely sure what was going on there if Makoto was hallucinating or if there's some obscure connection that they have that is literally magical based on Velvet Room persona kind of shenanigans. Now I am trying to remember if you do receive a copy of his book or something thing at the end, because then you could kind of think of that as being a foreword that Akinari wrote to Makoto at the front of the book or something. I feel like it'd be better if it was just framed that way. Like he leaves the book behind and yeah, you could say, oh, well, how would no one take the book? But you just suspend your disbelief for that. And you could show Makoto picking out the book, opening it up, reading this forward with Akinari's voice acting and portrait showing. Regardless, one of the best social links in P3 and hits even harder the later you do it into the game. Similar to Naoki, I would say that this is, if we're just talking about S-Links specifically and not the character as a whole, Whole, probably the best S link in P3, though I would still say the Dojimas kind of have maybe you could say an unfair advantage being so prevalent in the main story of P4, as opposed to being relegated to strictly a social link character. But despite Akinari being strictly a social link character, I think that he does end up cutting that S tier pretty easily. Again, take the rankings in S tier with a grain of salt. It's really just hard to quantify those kinds of things. All right, we have another split S-Link from P4. This time, though, these characters have nothing to do with each other. In fact, I don't even know if the other character even shows up in the game if you side with one of them. So my first playthrough of P4G, I picked Ayane. I didn't finish the Link, but I feel like I got enough out of it to know where I would place her. And then with Yumi, I picked her this time around and did her Link all the way through. And following doing that, I think I'm probably going to pick Ayane every single time after, at the very least, to see it all the way through next time. But Yumi's Link is really weird. I don't know why Narukami follows her to the hospital. It's just like a really uncomfortable thing. I feel like Yumi is totally justified to be pissed off at him. It's like, you barely know me and you like followed me here for this very personal family thing. It's very strange. Her link has some part to it regarding her father who was passing away, but she wasn't that close to him to begin with. But I think that there's some regret there, understandably, and her kind of dealing with that. I feel like there's enough about Yumi's link in particular that I don't really like that much to warrant putting her in D tier, but I could also maybe justify putting her in low C. I'll just throw her in D, I guess. I I don't hate her as a character, but her S-Link just doesn't really do it for me. Now, Ayane, from what I recall, she's a trombone player and not a great one at that. And so just kind of dealing with the insecurity of that, I suppose, and wanting to get better. I don't know much about her link outside of that. She's a very kind person, so that automatically kind of puts her somewhat up there. I would feel bad putting her anywhere below B, with obviously the possibility for her to be bumped up in the future. 
Yeah, we got Yoshida, the last of the Sun Links. I like this link quite a bit. Politician who actually means well, but has been kind of given a bad name because of certain things that happened in his youth. I can't say I remember a ton of the details, but I do think that Yoshida serves as a pretty good mentor figure for Ren, and I really like his perspective on things and wanting to change the system, given how corrupt it is, and all that kind of stuff is really admirable in how he teaches Ren to be true to himself, whether it's the easy thing to do or the hard thing to do, and you kind of help him keep his chin up regarding the public's kind of distaste for him because of the events that happened in his past, which also kind of escaped me, but yeah, I think pretty high A for Yoshida. And last but not least, we have Sai Nijima, the only Judgment Arcana character. I feel like Sai is prominent enough of a character to where she's kind of automatically in a higher tier. I have a hard time evaluating this character for whatever reason. I think because she does have so many different hats when it comes to her role in P5. Like your first introduction to her and for a lot of the game is her interrogating Ren in the present, whereas most of the game takes place as a flashback, which is a component to P5 that I really don't like. It works out in the end because once you get back to the present day, that does feel pretty satisfying to reach that point. But then after that point, I just feel like Sai as a character kind of gives me weird vibes. I don't know if it's because she was so stern and cold for much of the game and then all of a sudden is like so in your corner that it's a little off-putting. Like there's something about Sai smiling in the late game of P5 that just kind of makes me uncomfortable because of how she acted throughout the majority of the game's runtime to that point. And most of her confidant is not really about her as a character either. You get most of that through her sister's presence in the story as well as when Sai is a palace ruler and how she's kind of dealing with her parents not being around in a different way than Makoto, but uh, also kind of similar. They sort of do bury themselves in their work. Makoto kind of feels that pressure by her sister and society to double down on schoolwork and do as she's told and be perfect, basically. Whereas Sai is kind of imposing that on herself. I don't feel like she is explored as thoroughly as she could be. Maybe I'm just forgetting certain aspects of her as a character in P5, but she does feel maybe a little bit more like a plot device than an actual character to me. Ultimately, I do like Sai. I probably would put her in the A tier, but at the same time, she is kind of a character where I just don't really know what to make of her also. I think this is pretty accurate. Of course, this is more or less an abstraction of something that is really hard to put on paper in this way, but I do view tier lists as at least being a solid justification to talk about certain topics. It's a good mental exercise at the very least. So yeah, recording this ended up taking just about as long as the previous list, which makes sense because there are pretty much the same amount of characters. Thankfully, the antagonist list is only about 25 characters, so it should not be nearly as long as these first two. Go ahead and let me know what your guys' favorite characters characters are from this pool. I of course want to thank my channel members and shout out the Space Cowboy at the Super Shadow Operative tier. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe of course if you enjoyed and I will catch you guys in the next video.